Today's video is about Aristotle and his views on education. Aristotle is one of the greatest and most influential educational philosophers of all time. He was born in 384 BCE in the northern Greek town of Stagira and he spent his early life in Macedonia and at the age of 18 he travelled to Athens to complete his education where he studied at Plato's Academy. He was strongly influenced by Plato's teachings but he later came to reject some of the most important of them. After Plato died in 347 BCE, Aristotle left the academy and travelled to Asia Minor and Greece. In 343 BCE, he was invited by King Philip of Macedonia to tutor his 13-year-old son, Alexander. Aristotle returned to Athens in 336 BCE when Alexander became king and uh, he went on to establish his own school called the Lyceum where he taught for 12 years. Uh, due to growing Athenian hostility towards Macedonians after Alexander became king, Aristotle retired uh, where he died the following year. His philosophy has had a huge impact on Western thought. It wasn't until the 13th century that the main body of his writing was rediscovered in Western Europe. After that time, he was generally treated as an authority on most subjects, and any new theories that disagreed with what Aristotle said were initially treated with suspicion. Not all of his writings have survived, and what we do have are copies of what are believed to be his lecture notes. His educational ideas are broad, but in this video we will set out the essential points and the four components distinctive of any educational theory. Those are the theory of knowledge, theory of learning, uh, of the person, and of the role of education in society. First, let's look at Aristotle's theory of knowledge. So unlike Plato, Aristotle didn't believe that there are two separate orders of reality, but just one which we perceive through our senses. He talked of ideal forms, but not as transcendental entities uh, such as Plato, but rather these ideal forms were components of actual material objects. Plato's approach to knowledge was to reflect on an ideal world of unchanging perfect forms. However, Aristotle's approach was to examine more minutely the actual physical world in which we live. This has led to some regarding Plato as being an idealist and Aristotle as a realist in the sense of affirming the reality and objectivity of the physical world. Aristotle also saw the world as a dynamic place where everything is continually moving according to some inner purpose. All matter has a potential which it is striving to realize and in terms of education the aim is to help develop the child's potentialities into what he or she is best fitted to become. Now let's look at Aristotle's theory of learning. So how is this knowledge built up in the human mind? Aristotle also rejected Plato's theory that knowledge is innate within us. For Aristotle, knowledge starts with sense perception. We observe objects or events, and from these we build up in our mind a general principle by which to understand and explain these. This is known as the process of inductive reasoning. So what is inductive reasoning? Inductive, inductive reasoning is moving from particular observations to general conclusions. This is the prime method of reasoning used in science, in contrast to the deductive method of mathematics. Again, here we can see the differences between Plato and Aristotle. Plato is primarily interested in mathematics, whereas Aristotle is interested in science. Aristotle realized that not all reasoning is inductive, however. Once we have established a general principle or premise, we can deduce particular conclusions from it. For example, from the premises all men are mortal and Socrates is a man, we can deduce that Socrates is mortal. 
This is known as syllogistic reasoning, of which Aristotle wrote in some detail. However, for Aristotle, the actual development of new knowledge generally comes about by induction, and the process of learning is one of building up in the mind a picture of reality which corresponds with the real world outside. At birth, our mind is like a blank slate, but with capacities to act on impressions coming into it from the outside world. The role of the teacher is to help the child organize this vast range of empirical experiences to help provide some structure for all these disparate elements. This has been a persistent model of the teacher's role ever since. Aristotle on the person. So Aristotle held that humans possess a soul which gives form to the body, which is matter. When Aristotle spoke of the soul, however, he was not thinking of it in the same way we do today in a Christianized sense. And it is unlikely that he believed that the soul could exist apart from the body. Given that everything in life has a purpose, Aristotle asks, what is the purpose of humankind? His answer is to seek happiness. That is the sole self-sufficient good. But how do we achieve happiness? Basically, Aristotle says we do this by being virtuous. He develops his argument by making a distinction between intellectual and moral virtue. Intellectual virtue would be equivalent to what we would call today wisdom or intelligence. And this is mainly acquired by teaching and instruction. The other virtue, moral virtue, this is concerned with our conduct towards other people and this is mainly acquired by practice. When Aristotle says virtue is necessary for happiness, he is including both kinds of virtue, intellectual and moral virtue. The, the classical Greek word we translate as virtue does not have the same connotation as the English word virtue coming from the Latin virtus. The Greek word is arate, which roughly translates as inner excellence or fitness for purpose. If persons lack virtue, Aristotle believed they are not functioning as they should. They are not fulfilling their purposes efficiently and therefore it is impossible for them to achieve happiness. Aristotle is most interested in moral virtue and this is the type of virtue he goes on to examine, examine in the most detail. In trying to capture what is essential to moral virtue, he developed the idea that the virtuous action is generally a middle course between two extremes. For example, the virtue of generosity is a mean between meanness and prodigality. This doctrine has come to be known as the golden mean and has appealed ever since to uh, moralists who believe in moderation in all things and not getting carried away by one's emotions. Aristotle's argument that uh, virtue is necessary for happiness may seem to take uh, an expedient attitude to virtue, implying that we should be good just because it is likely to bring us happiness. But again, here there is a translation problem. The Greek word for happiness, eudaimonia, does not just mean a feeling of personal pleasure, as Aristotle himself points out. It means living the good life. So eudaimonia, it means being happy in the modern sense, but also the condition achieved, uh, the stable long-term affair of happiness applying over one's life. He says in a well-known passage that has uh, passed into modern day, everyday usage, one swallow does not make a summer, neither does one day. Similarly, neither can one day or a brief space of time make a man blessed or happy. Aristotle regarded eudaimonia as a public affair which involves playing one's proper role in society. So which of a person's activity best exhibits virtue for Aristotle and which of a person's activities is most likely to bring us long-term happiness? His answer is contemplation or the pursuit of intellectual understanding. 
This also brings to mind Aristotle's well-known definition of man as a rational animal. So Aristotle's conclusion is similar to Plato's, except for Aristotle, this intellectual contemplation focuses on a better understanding the physical world around us rather than the mental world of abstract forms as Plato spoke about. on education and society. Like Plato, Aristotle's uh, political ideas were influenced by his own aristocratic background. For instance, he thought that some people were slaves or manual laborers by nature, while others are naturally endowed to be soldiers or rulers. He was, however, not as suspicious of democracy as Plato. He favored a government called polity where the state is ruled by the best and wisest who are in a sense representative of all the people. Like Plato however Aristotle believed that the state should have complete control of education and use education as a means of preparing the desired type of citizens needed by the state. Also like Plato he was really only interested in the education of the free Greek citizen. Workers and slaves only needed basic training for their future jobs. So having uh, looked at Aristotle's basic assumptions in the areas of knowledge, uh, learning, human nature and society, we can now explore the implications of all this for his specific educational recommendations. Aristotle has the most to say about moral education and as we have noted already he held that moral virtue was mainly acquired by practice. As he says we become just by performing just acts, temperate by performing temperate ones and brave by performing brave ones. Hence uh, this shows the great importance of correct guidance by parents and teachers and if children are accustomed to the right moral habits from an early age doing the right thing will become second nature to them and this has become a very influential model of uh, moral education ever since then he goes on to raise an objection to what he has just said he says uh, if we become moral by doing moral acts does this not imply we are already moral for how otherwise could we do moral acts in the first place Aristotle's answer to this question is a landmark in thinking about moral education and one that is still highly influential today. Aristotle makes a distinction between acts in accordance with morality and moral acts proper. The actual behavior may be the same, for example helping someone in need, but the difference lies in the state of mind of the agent and his or her motives. For an act to be fully moral, Aristotle says, three conditions are necessary. One, we must act with knowledge. Two, we must deliberately choose the act for its own sake. And three, the act must spring from a fixed disposition of character. These three features have become widely accepted as necessary features of fully fledged moral action. Acts in accordance with morality, on the other hand, may be performed just out of habit, through fear of punishment or to gain approval of others. So Aristotle has resolved his own problem. It is quite possible to perform acts that correspond to morality before we are fully moral. This is in fact the only way to begin one's moral education and then as children mature intellectually, the true reasons as to why they should act morally can be provided and children can then move towards principled moral action. Modern psychologists, psychologists such as Piaget and Kohlberg have demonstrated empirically what Aristotle is saying here. So what about the rest of the curriculum apart from moral education? Here Aristotle does not have much to say explicitly but he would have a similarly graduated program uh, as Plato outlined. Up to about the age of seven this would have been physical and character training. From seven to age 21 this is the period of public state controlled education. The basic subjects would be gymnastics, reading, drawing and music. 
Aristotle wrote in most detail on the educational value of music. Apart from their immediate value, these subjects are designed to prepare the full Greek citizen for the final period of his education, which is understood to last for the rest of his life and extends beyond the confines of the school. So, unlike Plato, Aristotle excludes women from higher stages of education. The last stage mentioned here is the period of liberal education, called liberal for two reasons. Uh, the word liberal derives from the Latin liber, free. So this is an education that frees the mind from ignorance and it is also the education appropriate for free men. The subjects to be studied in this period are similar to those that we believe were taught at Aristotle's Lyceum. Mathematics, logic, metaphysics, ethics, politics, aesthetics, music, poetry, rhetoric, physics and biology. It is this final period of education that interested Aristotle the most and the one that he saw as being worthwhile in itself or possessing intrinsic value. This notion of the intrinsic value of education as opposed to any vocational or practical advantages it may lead to has been a constant theme in educational thought ever since. Many feel today that there is a danger of losing sight of this uh, intrinsic value of education uh, in the present climate of economic rationalism. Aristotle was uh, derogatory about using education for any extrinsic or instrumental purposes and it is here that some of his aristocratic prejudices come out most clearly. Aristotle believed that vocational uh, education was fit only for the lower classes but for the Greek citizen, the idea of education was to make you a fuller and more cultured person. Overall, uh, many of the key themes emphasized by Aristotle remain with us in education to the present day, including his empiricist model of how we learn, the stress on early habit training in moral education, followed by the acquisition of a principled morality, uh, the idea that happiness, virtue and contemplation are all interrelated and are key educational goals. And finally, the ideal of liberal education with its stress on the intrinsic values of learning.